Hey, hello, Cedar Hill family. Great to have you online with us again for another online service. We're still in level four lockdown, and that means we can't gather in person, but we can certainly worship the Lord together online. Before we do so this morning, I want to share with you a scripture. It's found in the book of John, John chapter 6. And it essentially is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. He does so because a young boy is generous with his lunch, with his five loaves and two fish. And Jesus is able to feel, feed a multitude. At the beginning of this chapter, in John chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible tells us that people follow Jesus because of the many miraculous healings that took place around him. I want to remind you this morning that Jesus is a healer. We follow him because he can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He's faithful and just. And I want to ask you this morning, in this moment of worship, would you cry out to the Father? Would you seek him for what he is able to do in your life? He's faithful to restore and to heal and to revive and to strengthen you, even in the midst of a struggle. The second thing I want us to notice from this portion of scripture is that Jesus takes, in verse 11, he takes the, the loaves and the fish, he gives thanks and he breaks them, he hands them out to the disciples and he feeds the 5,000. And what is it's certainly impossible for us as human beings is not impossible for God. The second point I want to make this morning, that what is impossible with man is not impossible for the Lord. I want to remind you that God is the God who is able to do the impossible in our lives. So I want to stir your faith this morning to believe Him. Believe Him that He's a healer. Believe Him that He can take care of you, even in the midst of chaotic circumstances. So come on family, I'm going to pray and let's worship the Lord together. Heavenly Father, this morning, thank you that you remind us from the scriptures that you are well able to do the impossible in our lives, to heal us and to provide for us, to take care of us. But not only are you able, you are willing. And we thank you this morning, Father, for your faithful, abundant provision in our lives. And we bless you this morning. We choose to give you all that we are in surrender of your beauty and wonder as we worship you together in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight Oh, it was my truth Till I met you I was breathing but now My failures I tried to hide Oh, it was my truth Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that place Out of the darkness Into your glorious name Oh 
break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name.
Wow, that was, a, that was amazing, family. It's always so good to worship the Lord. There's something so profound that takes place in us as we worship. Our perspective is changed. What seemed impossible to start with, uh, it doesn't stay that way. All of a sudden, we begin to see that God is well able. And I pray that as we worship, your perspective was shifted. And you were able to again believe in the wonderful, glorious power of our risen King, binding our hearts to faith, hope, and love like we so, spoke about last week. Well, we have a very special guest with us today, Keith Duplessis, who is our cotton oversight, is going to be ministering to us. And so I'm super excited. He's been such a blessing to me and to Corrine and to us as a church over the last couple of weeks as we've dealt with things here in KZN, all the kinds of chaos that we had to go through. And they're just such an amazing people, Keith and Shelley Duplessis. They're just so wonderful and they've been such a strength to us. And I know Keith has a profound word for us today out of the book of Nehemiah. So Keith, thank you so much for being with us. Family, enjoy. Good morning, Cedar Hill. It's just such a joy for Shelley and I to join you this morning and to bring greetings to you from Port Elizabeth. We have been very much involved in tracking what's happened to you as a community over this last week. And we want you to know that even though we are separated from you by a physical distance and many kilometers, the fact that we have biological family and you as our spiritual family in what was part of the epicenter of the destruction that took place um, in the looting and the uh, social dysfunctionality that we went through in, in the last two weeks, we have experienced with you to the extent that we could the dynamics that you um, had to go through. It's a great joy for me and a very, very real privilege to have been asked by the Wes and the leaders to speak to you today. But I trust that something of the Word of God that I have for you will help us just to process forward what it is that God wants to say to us in these days. A week on from the destruction that uh, really just devastated so much of our country and uh, this land that we love, and we're still coming to terms with what we're capable of doing to each other. We still can't believe, really, the level of destruction that has been meted out and what individuals are able to do to each other. There's been a lot of analysis that's gone on as to what brought it about and many suggestions have been made. And my suggestion to you today is that I think it's likely a combination of political, socioeconomic and opportunistic factors that led to what we have just witnessed. Many people from our president down are saying, we can never let something like this happen again. We can never let it happen again. But I want to say to you today, just nine short years ago, we said exactly the same thing after we could not believe what happened when the miners on the Marikana mine um, went on strike for higher wages and in an interaction with the police, men and women were shot down, killed, um, destruction followed in terms of infrastructure, and it, it still remains a scar on our collective psyche as a people. We said then we can never let this happen again, and yet here it is. It's happened again. It's happened again. And to make matters worse, the events that you walked through and lived through just a, a week and a half ago or so took place in a South Africa that claims to be a religious society to have a religious base, and within that religious base says we have a Christian majority. It means more people in South Africa claim to have some kind of allegiance to a Christian faith than any other faith or philosophy. But despite that, the kind of unbridled destruction that we saw, our communities being deeply affected, it happened in our country that supposedly has a Christian majority. Perhaps the thing that we learn most from history is that we just never learn any lessons from history. Shelley and I celebrated and delighted in last week's powerful statements and declarations that were made by the men from Cedar Hill who gathered in Wes's home and, and just spoke authentically about who they are, what being one in Christ means, how that affects our, our lives. 
And it was just a very stirring and, and deeply effective moment for me. And I have no doubt that those prophetic statements made by our brothers have had a huge impact even in the Amanzimtoti area in this week. But I also want to caution that making statements that mean something dear to us, and we say them in the relative safety of our own church environment and family, can only ever be a starting point in bringing about stability in our neighborhood. It can only be the starting point. It's not the, the end of it. We haven't done our duty when we've just made prophetic statements. If we as a church and as a community of believers are serious about this kind of stuff never happening again, then our long-term view and commitment has to go further because God's kingdom is built on two pillars, righteousness and justice. The word of God says in Proverbs 14 and verse 34, it is righteousness that exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach or a blemish or an embarrassment to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. God says, my standard for people, my desire for any society is that it is a righteous society. It lives in that place of blessing. In the absence of that righteousness, justice has to take its place. With all the calls for justice right now, we have to go back to the Word of God and keep this balance. And the best place for me to go to is the book of Micah, that minor prophet in the Old Testament. Micah was a prophet and he spoke to Judah, the nation of Judah, at a time of prosperity where the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer, there was social dysfunctionality, the inequality indexes were getting worse and worse by the day. And the poverty index was really just something which was a blemish on the nation that God said is my nation. So there are very distinct parallels between the time that Micah spoke the words of chapter 6 and what we're living through right now. That's why it's such a safe place to go. Micah says in verse 8 of chapter 6 to the people who are asking God, what is it that you want of us? What is that good thing? God says, the thing that is good, not right or wrong, the thing that is good for a society is that my people do three things. Number one, they act justly. They act justly. And dare I say, they act justly consistently. The church today has every reason to align itself with all of the calls that are being made in South Africa for justice to be done following what we saw happening in the last two weeks. The scale of destruction, the interruption in people's lives, the devastation of property, the stoppage of supply routes so that people's uh, health and food was at stake. The scale of that destruction and looting demands that justice has to be done. But as church people, as those who follow Jesus, we have to be careful while we align with the calls for justice, that our call for justice is done with the right motive and spirit. See, it's very easy right now when our emotions are raw and our psyche is, is, is touchy. It's very easy to become emotional while, when demanding justice in response to the looting and the destruction and when our safety has been compromised. And the danger is, folk, that we can set precedents that affect the long-term sanctity and safety of our society because we are emotionally demanding that justice be done now at a level that maybe wouldn't be the case if we hadn't felt so threatened, if, if the destruction hadn't been so widespread and so devastating. That's why Micah is a very good word for us today, because he reminds Judah that God's will for society's well-being is righteousness. And justice has its place in securing that righteousness when it is absent. But we cannot take our eye off what God says is his standard. It is righteousness because that exalts the nation. We need to take a step back this morning, however difficult that may be because you have lived in these circumstances. And we need to remind ourselves that from creation, 
God grounds the importance of who I am as an individual within the framework of the community to which I belong. In other words, I'm not just an island. I'm not the center of the universe. My identity and my individuality make sense within the, sc the scope of the community that I'm a part of. The African idea of Ubuntu really grabs that biblical principle when it says, for me to be who I am, I need to recognize who you are. So for me not to be concerned about my community's welfare goes counter to what God says is his call to act justly. Do you remember when God says to, to Cain, where is your brother? And in a very touchy moment, um, Cain's response to God is, Why, how should I know? Why should I care? Am I my brother's keeper? The, the word doesn't say God says to him, yes. But the subsequent events clearly demonstrate that God implies, absolutely, you are your brother's keeper. You should be looking after those things that are not just central to you. You do have a responsibility to the community. As Christ followers, we really do have a, a high moral ground to hold a government accountable for the exercise of justice. But we can do so only as those who follow Jesus if we ourselves are acting justly as law-abiding citizens. In the New Testament, Jesus said to his disciples in a very different context, but the principle was the same. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. What was Jesus saying? You need to be law-abiding citizens on the basis of the laws that the government has, ex has extended. And remember, Jesus was talking to people who were subject to Roman law, and that was an evil system in so many ways. It was punitive. It didn't favor people. It didn't help people. And yet Jesus says, if you follow me, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You may hate the laws. You may think that they're ridiculous. But to bring glory to God, we have to be law-abiding citizens. And when we are and our hands are clean, then we have the right to be able to speak prophetically and critically and accountably to government to hold things in law and order. We can also speak to government in that way. If our actions towards the community members is building them up and not impoverishing them or prompting the looting as desperate people reach out to try and make a living. COVID has seemingly shifted off the front pages and making a slight return this week. But we have a responsibility to the community equally to wear our masks, to do the social distancing, however much it irritates us. Because how dare we speak to government and hold them accountable for holding people who have looted to accountability and be just. If we are breaking other laws that are seemingly so sanitized or seemingly so small in comparison to the looting that went play. We have to act justly and do so consistently as the people of God. Secondly, we are to love mercy. There's a lovely Hebrew word for mercy, and it is the word chesed. And chesed means that which is abundant, extraordinary, uncommon, goodness, kindness, grace, and favor. Look at all of those words. Just think of the positive nature of those words and what that represents as God's heart in a righteous society. That there is abundance, there's extraordinariness, there is uncommon grace, goodness, kindness, and favor. The challenge for us as people in the church, those who follow Jesus, is we can exercise justice and fulfill what Hosea says, act justly. But we can do so as a cold, feelingless reality. Or we can choose to act justly as a compassionate society. I'm reminded that underpinning the book of Deuteronomy, which was God's practical explanation of the law that he was holding the people of Israel accountable to, a law that was meant to order society and bring about this righteous society, underpinning all of that wasn't God's heart to punish, but it was his heart to love that he said, this is the law. It's meant for your good. The challenge for me of of loving mercy is that it's not my natural default position. 
I'm much more inclined to wish on somebody what I think they've got coming to them when they've harmed me or hurt me or threatened me or made me feel insecure. So it takes courage and godly enabling to extend grace and mercy to those who are undeserving of our love and kindness, even when we still align ourselves with the fact that justice needs to take its course. But just because justice is taking its course does not mean that we cannot be a compassionate society and probe what has been behind it. What are those societal dysfunctions that keep South Africa coming back to the place where we have to say every couple of years or every decade, we cannot let this happen again, and yet it happens. We have to push through to establishing righteousness and not just settle for justice to be done. What Micah holds up as God's directive is not just an Old Testament principle. Jesus demonstrated this mercy to the woman that was caught in adultery, to the Samaritan woman that he sat talking to at the well, and to Zacchaeus, that, that, that hated tax collector who was actually entrenching Roman rule that people just despised. Jesus reached out to them and he extended and demonstrated for us what justice looks like within the framework of a compassionate society who love mercy. Even the early church saw as the essence of their fellowship and their followership of Christ, that they had to see to the needs of the vulnerable and the abused. They looked after the widows and the orphans, not just as a kind of little crisis thing, and when the crisis was done, they moved off. It was a long-term commitment. In other words, while justice to end lawlessness that broke out now is urgent, if we do not address these underlying issues of a broken society, if we don't try and understand them, if that celebration of a non-racial family and being one in Christ is that we celebrated last week is God's heart, for the community of Amanzim Toti. Then we need to take some positive steps and we need to work out what those positive steps are to changing that climate in our own community going forward. Because if we don't address these underlying issues of a broken society, we keep on simply repeating the same old issues and making the same mistakes. So we have to act justly and love mercy. And lastly, we're called by God in building this righteous society to walk humbly with our God. Humbly is a challenging concept for me. Because even in the wake of what we've seen, there's much headline attention seeking and grabbing at the moment. As people are being rewarded and lauded for what they're doing and how they're helping and so forth. And that's great. It's, it's wonderful that people have responded so well. Big organizations are getting big PR kudos as a result of it. But at a time of brokenness like this, I'm reminded that Jesus says his way is walking humbly. Eugene Peterson, he wrote and he said, No other culture has been as eager to reward either nonsense or wickedness. In doing so, it has redefined the norms, values and principles of society. He then says, we live in a culture where image is everything and substance is nothing. Where a new beginning is far more attractive than a long follow through. Images are important. Beginnings are important. But an image without substance is a lie. A beginning without a continu continuation is a lie. We just have to look at some of the chaos that has uh, engulfed our government press conferences in this week where ministers have been at each other's throats, where there's been public dispute about who's responsible and who isn't responsible. We just have to look at how lacking in substance so much of the image is and what has been desperately tried to be conveyed to us by governing authorities at every level and blame shifting and so forth has simply proven that it's image without substance. And we desperately need to have leadership at every level of our society that is not just concerned with the image, but with the substance of serving. 
We need not just beginnings. It's too easy to say, oh, we got it wrong. Let's keep on beginning, beginning. We need beginnings that stop just being beginnings and follow through for the betterment of our society and for the glory of God. And if it's not going to happen in the organized structures that we have elected, then it's got to happen with us as we become the salt and the light of the world to bring glory to Jesus. These past two weeks have brought us face to face with how shallow or lacking in substance much of the image that we have of our nation and its leaders and even some of our churches really is. And how little follow through ever occurs from every new beginning we are promised and we promise. We can just make new beginnings and we can lurch from one crisis to another. The true test of what Cedar Hill will contribute into a Manzum Toti society and community in the, in the days ahead is going to be that what has started as response to crisis becomes the catalyst for us to be able to work on continuation and continuity in those things that lead to the betterment of the very community whose needs maybe we begin to understand better and take leadership in that. The path to securing righteousness in our society will not be public images that promise the world or yet another beginning. It's going to come when we act as the salt and the light behind the scenes, out of the public glare, and live these three distinctives that God has called us to. When we learn to live in a place of acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. I want to bless you this morning with every spiritual blessing from heavenly places. And may we as a church and as a community of believers in Amanz and Toti, as we begin to pick up this challenge of continually acting justly, continually loving mercy, continually walking humbly with our God, see him do mighty deeds through us and change the whole of Amanz and Toti as a, 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 a real gem and an example to the rest of our country of how a community turns and lives that righteous life that God has called us to live. We bless you, Shelley and I, and we send our love and greetings to you today. Have a wonderful Sunday and a great week ahead. God bless you. Hey family, that was amazing. I'm super encouraged. I pray that you are too. Thank you for being with us. We will be doing this again next week, same time, same place. But if you need anything or want to find out any information about us at Cedar Hill Church, you can find us on our Facebook page. Or you can check out our Instagram page. Uh, but thank you for being with us. Love you guys. See you next week.